Hello. We're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Reliable Detection of Low Abundance Somatic Mutations from Heterogeneous Solid Tumor Samples. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Agena Bioscience. Whether assessing sample quality, screening samples for actionable mutations, or enabling routine genetic testing for tens to thousands of samples, Agino Biosciences products and services help laboratories translate genomic discoveries into mainstream clinical practice. Let's get started. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. You can post questions to the speakers during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. I now present today's speakers, Daryl Irwin, PhD, and Bobby Collett Sutton, PhD, MD. Dr. Irwin has been leading the scientific services and applications development operations at Agena Bioscience in the Asia-Pacific region, and more recently, in a global capacity for 10 years. Dr. Irwin has a PhD from the University of Queensland in non-invasive prenatal testing. He has authored more than 20 publications, numerous book chapters, and holds several patents. Dr. Sutton received her MD and PhD from Indiana University, followed by an anatomic and clinical pathology residency at the Bowman Gray School of Medicine at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and an additional year of surgical pathology training at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. In addition to anatomic and clinical pathology, she is also board certified in blood banking and transfusion medicine and molecular genetic pathology. She joined the Medical Foundation in 2000 and serves as the Medical Director of Blood Donor Services, Blood Bank Services, and Molecular Pathology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Irwin. He will now begin his presentation. Thank you, Judy. It's commonly agreed that the discipline of molecular genetic testing is one of the fastest evolving areas of today's pathology, and that that evolution, particularly in the area of molecular oncology, is delivering tangible health outcome improvements to our cancer patients. The rapid evolution always comes with its challenges. No longer do we get large resection samples that we're testing for maybe one biomarker, to assign to a single therapy. In order to provide greater access to targeted therapies and to reduce adverse outcomes, we now get these tiny little tissue samples that we need to analyze for multiple biomarkers to select from various therapies that may be effective for these patients. And if that's not challenging enough, we need to do this quickly, cost-effectively, and most importantly, accurately. Not only is what we're trying to achieve evolving, but the technology tool, tools that we can choose from to achieve these outcomes is evolving equally as rapidly. And today I'm going to present to you Agena's latest evolution in technology, our IPLEX HS chemistry, and how this and the panels that we have designed on this chemistry can be used for reliable detection of low abundance somatic mutations from heterogeneous solid tumor samples. So here are some of the challenges in oncology listed in dot point. As I said before, we have very small samples. Common sample types include fine needle aspirates, thin needle core biopsies, where there's only a small amount of tissue available for analysis. And in order to do routine anatomical analysis, these small tissue samples are put into FFPE blocks that highly degrade the DNA such that we have highly variable and degraded samples available for nucleic acid analysis. We want to analyze those multiple different biomarkers so that we can select from the various therapies. But these tissue samples are not pure. 
we have this challenge of heterogeneity, and that is the amount of cancer cells that are mixed in with normal cells in the biopsy. And within those cancer cells, the variability in the cancer itself, the various different clones that are present. Now, an invasive biopsy is rarely repeated. It's an invasive process with its own risks, and therefore it's a single analysis of a section of a single, single tumour that is only a single point in time. So it doesn't cover the entire metastatic disease. Now, all of these challenges do need access to a sensitive and accurate detection technology, such as the mass array that is offered from a gene of bioscience. However, we can further break them down. The first four here, our limited quantity, our variable quality, our multiple analytes and our heterogeneity, can be improved by using robust short amplicon technologies that are highly multiplexed and use small amounts of sample input, such as our IPLEX HS biochemistry. So our IPLEX HS biochemistry allows us to rescue critical samples, samples that wouldn't be able to be analysed on alternative technologies but now can be analysed on this robust short amplicon highly multiplexed technology with low input material. We have very short turnaround time. Our time from DNA to result is less than eight hours and a very simplified lab process. Not a complex multi-step process, but a simple, simple workflow that any general clinical laboratory can follow. And the improvement in the chemistry itself now allows us to get down to 1% allele frequency detection, allowing you to test low frequency, um, low tumor content samples and expand your assay menu. Now, it's not going to, to, to resolve all of the challenges. There will be a point where heterogeneity gets so low that you don't actually have tumour cells or the type of tumour cell that you're looking for in your sample. The fact that it is rarely repeated and difficult to track samples as their disease evolves and the fact that it's a single site won't be resolved by just improving sensitivity and robustness of, of tissue biopsies. And really these challenges are the opportunity to look at circulating tumour DNA or circulating tumour cells to improve and complement the clinical workup. Now that isn't the, the, the topic of today's discussion. Um, we did present a webinar last month on liquid biopsy, which you can access from the Agena Bio Bioscience website in our resources section and videos and webinars, and hear about how our liquid biopsy panels can be used to detect uh, circulating tumor material down to 0.1% frequency so that you can monitor disease progression, advanced therapeutic research. But moving back to our IPLEX HS chemistry. So our existing chemistry, chemistries, we have our liquid biopsy chemistry called UltraSeq at a 0.1% mutation frequency limit of detection. And we have our standard IPLEX Pro biochemistry and we're now introducing our new IPLEX HS biochemistry, allowing us to detect in solid tumor samples mutation frequencies down to 1%. So let me describe for you the biochemistry workflow. So starting from just 10 nanograms of input DNA, um, coming from those fine needle aspirates that have been, been formalin fixed, paraffin embedded, of course other, other sample types are also able to be put into this. We have this short amplicon PCR, a multiplex PCR of multiple amplicons that is very short in its amplicon size such that it's highly robust on degraded template. And here is an example of a 1% mutant, which is our AT um, um, mutant, mutant nucleotide and 99% wild type being our CG. We amplify that sample and then we do a single base extension. So we anneal a primer adjacent to our position of interest and we extend a single base and with our IPLEX HS chemistry we actually do a single base extension that is enriched in efficiency for generating the mutant product. That is that, that extension onto the mutant, mutant um, termination base is, is more efficient than the extension onto the wild type such that we're driving down our sensitivity. So we are still observing the wild type, however, we're, we're increasing the frequency in the biochemistry of the mutant such that we can detect these low frequency mutations. 
following the single base extension with our newest instrument, our chip prep module, which you can see in this third box. It's completely automated sample conditioning, transferring onto the spectra chip and mass spectrometry analysis. So the Agena Bioscience system uses mass spectrometry as an, as an analyzer, such that it's very quick, highly accurate, because we're measuring the unlabeled nucleic acid itself down to its molecular mass. And then finally, because it is mass spectrometry, which mass spectrometry delivers a very, very flat baseline, highly specific sharp peaks in the position, we are able to, to generate very simple user-friendly mutation reports for these particular samples. And on the screen in front of you, I have an example of a 1% mutation in the red there. And you can see that's a very clear peak from the baseline at that 1% mutation frequency versus the wild type peak in black on the left there, um, which uh, um, uh, is at 99% frequency. So to further demonstrate this, this is our IPLEX HS chemistry and a dilution series of horizon control samples and specifically these two mut mutations that we're diluting are resistance mutations for lung cancer and colon cancer. At the top, we have our EGFR T790M mutation, a resistance marker to second generation EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy, but inc an inclusionary marker for third generation EGFR TKI therapy being oseteronib. And here you can see a dilution from 5% mutation frequency down to 1.25% mutation frequency, and of course the wild type control on the right hand side. And you can see that that mutant peak is clearly detectable all the way down to that 1%. In the bottom, we have our EGFR S492R mutation. This is a resistance mutation in colorectal cancer, and specifically colorectal cancers that are on EGFR blockade therapy, because the position of this mutation is up in the extracellular domain of EGFR. And again, seeing that very clear mutant peak underneath the red MUT, sing, um, uh, MUT uh, word, uh, letters, going all the way down to 1.25% and no signal detected on our wild type control. So we've had some change in guidelines of late. So this is the new draft guidelines from, from CAP, uh, IASLC and AMP. These draft guidelines were released in November 2016 after a period of consultation and there's been some new recommendations. So in addition to EGFR and ALK um, being recommended uh, molecular markers for non-small cell lung cancer, they're now recommending in multi-gene panels, such as those that we provide from Agena Bioscience on the mass array, to include BRAF molecular testing and ERBB2. BRAF is, is, is focused around just three, um, three amino acid changes in the BRAF gene, and the ERBB2, also known as HER2, is different to those in breast cancer in that it's not the amplifications that we're looking for in lung cancer, but we're actually looking for in, uh, short repetitive insertions in ERBB2. So we have designed our new HS panel for lung um, to incorporate those guidelines. So you can see we're covering BRAF and the three major codons that are relevant in lung cancer in BRAF. Broad EGFR um, mutation detection from the single nucleoti uh, nucleotide changes, single missense mutations such as L858R, T790M of course, um, the C797S, the new resistance marker to oseteronib, but also broad coverage of EGFRs, exon 19, deletions and exon 20 insertions. I haven't written out all the mutations on this slide because it makes for a very, very busy slide, but we do have all of those specific mutations available as a list on request. We have more than 40 deletions in exon 19 and 10 insertions in exon 20 in this particular panel. KRAS covering codons 12, 13, and 61, the ERBB2 in repetitive insertions, and we've also included PIK3CA. So in total, we have five genes in this panel, more than 70 mutations. And all of this is achieved from a single multiplex PCR reaction. With a single multiplex PCR reaction, we have completely minimized the input DNA required, such that it comes down to mathematical probabilities. If you wish to detect 1% mutation frequency, which is the limit of detection of this chemistry, well, that's one in 100, and therefore you do need to put in at least 100 molecules in order to see the one. If you only put in 10 molecules, I guess it will still work, but you'll only see one in 10 at best. 
So it's, just, it's all the way, basically our input material is now just down to mathematical probabilities of getting that mutation allele into the PCR reaction. Moving on from lung cancer, we've also seen new guidelines published in JMD um, just last month. Uh, so the new, new guidelines for colorectal cancer um, being published last month after a consultation and draft period last year, coming out from ASCP, CAP, AMP and ASCO. And the new recommendations for colorectal cancer are extended RAS testing. So KRAS and NRAS analysis of codons 12, 13, 59, 61, 117 and 146. And also re recommending analysis of BRAS, particularly the V600, um, V600E mutation in these colorectal cancer samples. Now these draft recommendations came out early last year and what we did early last year is we actually extended our existing OncoFocus panel which was on our previous IPLEX Pro chemistry and we, we collaborated with Dr Sutton from the Medical Foundation and we looked at, at um, we did a clinical study with extended RAS and BRAF included in 259 FFPE colorectal cancer samples from the Midwest there um, and what we were able to observe is that the extended RAS mutations were identified in 41% of cases and in fact the extension of RAS, so that is not just analysing codon 12 and 13 of KRAS but extending sending it out to all of those different codons in both uh, KRAS and NRAS increased the, the, the detection of mutations by 15% in those samples. Also observed that 12% of those samples harboured BRAF. So by extending a panel to the new guidelines, we had an additional 27% mutation detection yield in these particular samples. Now what we what we have done is then taken that extended RAS um, content and we've moved it onto our new IPLEX HS chemistry. So that in addition to the extension increasing our detection, mutation detection yield, we can also get that improved sensitivity. So that extended KRAS um, series, the extended NRAS series, our BRAF V600E and two other codons in BRAF, we've included PIK3CA and we've also included the S492R extracellular domain resistance mutation in EGFR. And in fear of sounding like a broken record, we have also achieved this in a single multiplex PCR reaction such that we've completely minimised that input material and achieving down to 1% mutation frequency detection. I'm going to allow Dr Sutton to explain the, uh, the clinical outcomes of, of uh, increasing that sensitivity in both the lung and colon, um, colon um, panels. So we've moved on, we've evolved as well. We're a technology provider that's constantly evolving, evolving from our original 5% limit of detection and now releasing our new IPLEX HS colon and lung panels, achieving down to 1% mutation frequency detection in these clinical samples. And we also do have our UltraSeq colon and lung panels, which allow liquid biopsy analysis down to 0.1%. So with the mass array, we are able to achieve, we, we are now releasing new targeted panels to identify mutations of known significance in both colon and lung samples. As I've said, we've completely minimised that sample input material required coming from a single PCR reaction. We have robust assays that are, that, that are optimised for these highly degraded and low frequency heterogeneous samples. We have a very fast turnaround time. Completely automated post-PCR processing and mass spectrometry analysis allows us to, to achieve results in less than eight hours. And our sensitivity, we are able to detect more than 50 mutations in these panels down to as low as 1% mutation frequency. So I'll now uh, hand it back to the moderator and let Dr Sutton explain to you how these panels perform in a clinical environment. Thank you, Dr. Irwin, for that informative presentation. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Sutton. Oh, good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I've been working in the foundation now for over 15 years, and in the last few years, I have become the um, molecular pathology director of the foundation and before I launch into this discussion of the mass array, 
thought it would be a good idea to kind of show you a little bit about the organization that I represent so that you know, get a better idea of the number of cases that we see and our patient clientele that we see. Um, basically, the Medical Foundation is a pathology group and reference laboratory that serves several hospitals over a region. Um, we are also a blood processing and distribution uh, facility. Um, we have about 750 employees, about 18 pathologists. We've had a couple of retirements, but we're also adding a couple more on, so I think we're at 17 now. Um, Volume-wise, we do a lot of anatomic pathology because we serve several hospitals, um, about 55,000 surgicals, quite a few marrows and cytologies, both uh, non-GYN and GYN. Um, we collect blood. It's in the neighborhood of 25 to 30,000 products uh, collected and distributed this year. In all, throughout our system, about 6 million tests, give or take. And we've been in this business quite a while. We had our 100-year anniversary uh, back in 2012. So this whole laboratory system, uh, we have our central laboratory facility, which is in South Bend. Our former name was the South Bend Medical Foundation. You will also see that. It's kind of a, um, we have two names that are pretty much interchangeable out there. Um, you may see us as SBMF or the South Bend Medical Foundation. We have our central lab that's in South Bend. Those are our major hospitals in this facility or this, in this area, but then we also reach down into central Indiana. And also uh, we have draw sites, satellite laboratories, and reach uh, a number of physician, uh, or physician offices. So it really is a, a large operation for both anatomic and clinical pathology. So how did we start on this quest? Well, it began back in about 2012 and 2013. We began to look for a new molecular platform that would address this growing need for broader mutation coverage in common solid tumors. This is when things like the NCCN guidelines were starting to evolve, and um, there was this need to do more mutation analysis and um, well, the kits that were available then um, weren't keeping up with what the literature was really saying and what our oncologists were frankly demanding of us as their literature moved on. And like many laboratories at that time, we were using PCR-based kits that could detect typically like codons 12 and 13 in KRAS, BRAF V600D, and then the four axons in EGFR, a number of mutations in each. But as that literature, literature went forward, we realized our clients wanted and needed more to treat their patients. So how do we approach this problem? Well, we talked to some of our colleagues in our region, um, the St. Joseph Regional Medical Center, that's one of two hospitals in our system, um, Memorial Hospital South Bend, that's actually now Beacon Medical System, that's two major hospitals, and then we're also, uh, South Bend is the home of the University of Notre Dame, and we have some colleagues at the Har Harper Cancer Re Research Institute. And we all wanted to do the same thing. We wanted to increase the avail availability of medically appropriate solid mut tumor mutation analysis and in this community-based medicine environment. We're not a big, you know, academic teaching hospital. Um, these are all uh, community-based uh, facilities. We wanted to have this testing available for our patients. So um, we worked with our colleagues at the Harper Cancer Research Institute, and they sought out and were successful in getting grant funding from the Walter Cancer Foundation, and that allowed us to partially supplement the cost of the, the analyzer, the mass array analyzer, and also to supplement patient costs for testing. So it was really a win-win for patients. And also additionally, the Harper Cancer Research in Institute was quite interested in the ability to uh, use this equipment for their uh, growing uh, tumor bio uh, biobank. So why did we pick the Agena system? Well, at this time, this is back in again in about 2013, the hot new science out there that was coming of age 
for um, clinical laboratories was next generation sequencing. And we looked at it very, very hard. Um, but there were some problems there. Number one, I'm the lone molecular pathologist in my group. I don't have a large bioinformatics group to fall back on to help me with interpretations. Uh, same thing for the computer assistance and infrastructure that's really needed to set up and validate a uh, NGS uh, laboratory. And also that was at a time where um, the NGS was growing as well and, and changing. There were a lot of updates going on in the technology. And I really felt that that project would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for me and my, my group. On the other hand, um, we still wanted this large amount uh, to greatly increase the number of mutations that we could detect from a single sample. And um, that's why we went with the mass array platform. It's been an outstanding decision for our laboratory. So we brought it in, and uh, actually we brought the machine in in early 2014. And one of my concerns about NGS is I felt like it could take us easily over a year to validate it. Um, with mass array, we brought it in and we validated it in a few months. Um, it went up quickly. It performed robustly. And um, we really were able to get it up and functioning and on live clinically in, in I thought, a very good uh, short amount of time. And when you consider that my organization during that same time frame was working to put in a new laboratory information system, I think that the staff in my lab did an outstanding job. So what else can I say about this? We went with the uh, OncoFocus panel that covers um, this 300 plus common mutations in KRAS, NRAS, BRAS, and EGFR, and because we were also wanting to add more for um, metastatic melanoma, we also added a KID extension that covers some about 85% of the common mutations in KID. And the sensitivity of this panel um, is, as Daryl mentioned, a 5 to 10 percent very allele fraction, although I will tell you that now having worked with this for about, well, three years now, there will be occasional cases that you will be able to see and clearly call below 5 percent, but that's rare. Um, that is, to me, uh, a downside is when you get down below 5 percent, there will be cases that you will not be able to confidently call the mutation. And just on the bottom end, or the bottom side of that frame, is just what the analyzer looks like. So, how's this project fared? Well, it's done, I think, very well. Um, it's been, I think, a boon to patients in our community um, because we've been seeing, because they're screening more patients for early lung cancers, we're seeing a lot of uh, biopsies for lung, but also for colorectal adenocarcinoma and, yes, for metastatic melanoma. About 200 cases a year each of pulmonary non-small cell carcinoma and about 200 of colorectal carcinoma and about 30 cases a year of metastatic melanoma. We've been working with the Oncophoscus version 2 panel with the KID extension up until 2015 when we added the extended RAS. And as, uh, Dr. Irwin mentioned, um, we had an AMP poster on that data in 2015 showing the extended RAS and how that did pick up an additional 15% of mutations that were considered clinically significant. Um, and we had that panel live again very quickly. So um, in, our, in my laboratory, uh, Mass Array, it's been a reliable workhorse, um, it's rarely down. Uh, when, we, when it does go down, we can talk to the folks at Agena. They can remotely remote into our system and sometimes fix things. But it's been really a workhorse that um, is reliable. And in fact, we're, we've added more to it. Now we're doing cystic fibrosis testing also. We added that to the platform um, as well. And um, when I learned last year, that Agena was developing the IPLEX high sensitivity with the 1 to 2 percent allele fraction uh, detection. I was very excited about this. And here's why. Um, I don't know how many in our audience out there are anatomic pathologists, but I am an anatomic 
anatomic pathologist. I sign out both sur surgicals and cytologies as well as these other things that I do uh, clinical pathology-wise. But all of us have seen cases like this. This is a photomicrograph from a pleural fluid cytology cell block. That big group of cells in the middle of the field is a few cohesive adenocarcinoma cells and a lot of other things. It's got uh, lymphocytes and some mesothelial cells in the background, but that's not a lot of tumor. And this is exactly the kind of case where you look at it and you go, wow, I like to see 10 to 20 percent tumor visually when I assess cases before going to the mass array. And this one really didn't have it, but then I get that phone call from the oncologist and I'm hearing about how, oh, please run this because this patient, um, they are really sick, they've got a high tumor burden, but they're so sick we don't want to risk putting them through a biopsy. We've got tumor in this sample, please run it, please run it. So we ran it and on the Oncofocus version 3 panel, it was negative for mutations in EGFR, KRAS, BRAF, and again, the sensitivity there is 5 to 10%. And I have a qualifier that I put on cases like this in my sign out, basically reminding the clinician that um, there was not a lot of tumor here. If another sample from this patient's cancer becomes available, you might want to test again. But when this study came up and we collaborated with Agena, this is one of the cases that we included. And lo and behold, when we took the sensitivity down, to 1% with the Oplex HF, this case was positive for BRAF B600E mutation, and that result was subsequently confirmed in a second independent digital PCR assay. Now, I went and I looked at those original Oncofocus panel data to say, can I see this? Was this really there? And no mutation was called by the software, but let me show you what that review showed. And I'll first step back a minute and kind of show those of you who have not seen what the spectrum output is from mass array. Uh, Dr. Irwin showed you some of this, but on the left-hand side of the screen, we've got the wild type, which does not show a second peak where the mutant allele is. And on the right-hand side, you've got two different cases, each of which have a BRAF B600E mutation up at the top, the BRAF 1799F, that's for forward, is in well one. That's the particular PCR reaction that has this particular mutation detectable in it. And it's part of a fourplex, basically, that gives us a total group of reactions that says, yes, B BRAF B600E is there. And what's really nice about this technology, in addition to getting these really quite robust peaks. When they're there, you see them. Uh, but you can also get an idea of the varying allele frequency that's in your specimen. So this is actually two different cases, one of which had a 27% mutation allele frequency in it, and the bottom one with a little bit higher peak, a 39%. So uh, I have found when I've compared to other technologies, technologies that this data is roughly comparable to what you get from, say, a pyro sequencing or an NGS where you get an idea of how much mutation is represented in that sample. So this is the kind of data that you get. Now let's look at our particular case. Okay, Up at the top, that's the breakdown of the fourplex for your BRAF. So you can see what wild type is and then the different mutations that can be detected with this particular assay. And so then move down into the two spectra. With the BRAF 1799 forward in well one, there is a very small mutant allele at A. And I've got a circle around it to show it to you, but when you look along that baseline, that's really not much above the baseline. Prospectively, the, the software couldn't call it, and even on review, I mean, it's there, I think, but I understand why the software didn't cover it didn't call it. And then on the bottom one is the second one, the 1799R for reverse. There's supposed to be a peak there, and yeah, well, you can maybe, maybe squint at it, but really not much above baseline. So it's probably there, but prospectively with just this data, I could not call this. 
However, um, oops, I went too far. However, we could see it with the IPLEX HS, and we could see it when it was confirmed by the second technology. So this is a second case that illustrates how powerful I think this new, um, new PCR configuration is. This is a core biopsy of a left upper lung lobe nodule, thin needle core biopsy, and you can see in this close-up inset picture that there is a small, close, a small cluster of malignant cells there, but there's also a lot of stroma in the background, there's inflammatory cells, and there's really only a small portion of this material that is represented by tumor. And even with microdissection, which we do, we do, um, we do, um, hand dissection to try to increase the um, increase the uh, proportion of tumor cells in any material when we think that'll help. Um, in this case, um, there's just not much tumor there, and our Oncofocus panel showed no mutations. Well, um, interestingly, and to me, this was one of the ones that I call a game changer. When this case was in the study that we did, um, lo and behold, there's an EGFR LA58R mutation, and that was confirmed independently by a second digital PCR. And those of you out there who are uh, doing these sorts of uh, mutations know, again, that's a mutation that changes the type of treatment that the patient will get. That one is a game changer. You don't want to miss an EGFR LA58R. So this one made me stand back and go, okay, 1% is an improvement. So I went back and I looked at the original panel run data. It was called by the software with only a medium probability of being a true mutation. And here we are, the Oncofocus Spectrum case. There's where that box there is where the mutant peak should be. And I'm, it may be there. You really can't see it. Again, it's not above baseline. The bottom frame, on the other hand, is from the IPLEX HS, clearly showing a mutant peak. So we can pick this up at this uh, sensitivity level and give us spectra that are readable and are robust which to me is very impressive. So in this study that we uh, performed, we looked at 179 cases of pulmonary non-small cell carcinoma, uh, which had an adenocarcinoma component. All the previously detected mutations that we saw with the IPLEX, or excuse me, with the Oncofocus were there. But we found an additional 17 cases, about 10%, showed additional low-frequency mutations using this more sensitive IPLEX HS chemistry. Now, I went back and I looked at all the original spectra. I confirmed eight mutations. I thought they were likely there, but just too weak to call. Two of those were EGFR LA58Rs. There were two new low-frequency second mutations that we hadn't seen the first go-round as well as five new KRAS, two NRAS, and two new BRAF, and one LA58R mutations. And all of these new mutations, again, uh, we got the digital PCR. In fact, my colleagues at Agena did this. Uh, we're able to confirm all these new mutations uh, by this second independent platform. And when I broke out all the specimen types, didn't surprise me, of these 17 cases, 14 came from small tissue samples, needle core biopsies, cytology cell blocks, where the frequency of tumor cells in the population that you tested was low. So I thought this really showed the power of the IPLEX HS chemistry. And it's my plan to move our lung testing to this. Now, um, there was a second part of this. Um, that we also did a similar um, experimental design looking at colorectal adenocarcinoma that had been previously tested for KRAS, NRAS, and BRAS on our previous or on our Oncofocus panel. Looked at 143 cases. Once again, if we saw it the first time, we saw it the second time, the previously detected mutations were confirmed. 
but we also identified eight new mutations, five of which were a second low-frequency mutation in a different site, but, again, when you think about treatment, potentially game changers. Three of these were new mutations, and they were all in the RAS, two in KRAS and one in NRAS, which potentially could change the therapy for the patient. So that pretty much summarizes the work that we've done on this. As I mentioned, my plan is to bring in and validate the uh, IPLEX HS chemistry, particularly for lung, possibly for colon as well, uh, just simply because I look at this data and think that, um, well, to serve my patients, I think this is a necessary step. So I, I don't like missing low-frequency mutations that might change a patient's treatment. So um, that's pretty much um, the, the data that I wanted to show today. I want to thank you all for your attention, but I also want to mention one other thing, and that is um, I want to mention the members of my team. Um, I've been... I'm very proud to be a part of the Medical Foundation, and I want to thank my administration, Dr. Simpson and Azenikwe. Um, uh, I could not have done this project without them. They're not on here, but I want to thank also my collaborator collaborators at the University of Notre Dame, uh, but also manager of the lab, Kevin Maggart, and then members of the team that work very hard and learn this technology and use it every week. In fact, I've got my Mass Array sign out on my desk right now. Um, that's Tammy Ray, Joan Kiss, Tish, and Jessica Dowd. Um, my thanks to all of them for your wonderful work, and um, thanks to you all for your attention to me. Thank you, Dr. Thank Irwin you. and Dr. Thank Sutton, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Irwin and Dr. Sutton will answer as many questions as time permits. And the first question is for Dr. Irwin. I'm confused about how the mutant allele percentage in the pre-amplified sample is calculated if there is a preferential single base extension of the mutant allele, thus enriching the mutant in the amplified sample compared to the original sample. Can you explain briefly? Sure. So with the new IFLEX HS chemistry, um, as you say, we are biasing towards the mutant allele, uh, the generation of the, the mutant allele. The bias that's introduced is reproducible <clears throat> in, in that, therefore, it's, it, it's, it's linear it's, and, and it's reproducible, and then we can normalize back to the original mutant allele frequency to determine what the original mutant allele frequency was in the sample. So we're achieving increased detection of low-frequency mutations, but have the capacity to then normalize that to determine what the frequency was in the, in, in the initial sample. Okay, the next question is for Dr. Sutton. What kind of FFTE extraction platform are you using, and is the IPLEX HS very sensitive to the DNA quality? We use a Kyogen FFTE kit, um, so it's commercially available. And from my perspective, I think we get good quality DNA when we look at it say, from the spectrophotometer measurements. Um, we don't run gels to look at quality from that perspective. Um, we do this as really part of a, a clinical, um, part of a, a, it's part of our clinical processes. And essentially, we look at the quantity of the DNA we get, and we pretty much go with that. So I don't know how much I can can really comment on in terms of looking at the quality of the DNA per se because we're not specifically asking that question. Okay. This next one, um, let's see. This next one is for um, for Dr. Sutton. Um, do you have do you have clinical outcome on lower minor allele frequency cases and outcomes for um, EGFR inhibitor therapy? And there are more parts to this question, so I have to answer this part all. I wish I did. Um, this is part of the um, 
part of the grant study that I know some of my colleagues at Notre Dame are hoping to get in the next phase of the grant. But unfortunately, what I have found is that often the treatment notes of the patient, which is what we're talking about here, um, are in the individual oncologist's office notes, and that's not something that I can readily access. So I wish I had a better answer for that. It's a great question, and I agree. This, it's very pertinent to this discussion, but from my perspective, it's not one that I can readily get to the data. Okay, and this is audience members, the second part of their question. Are you looking at clinical outcomes and finding these low-frequency mutations in other tumors, et cetera, or do you think this is just purely a sampling issue and not representative of tumor clonality and heterogeneity? Uh, again, I don't have the ability to do the clinical outcomes part of this from, from, from my laboratory. I don't have access to that clinical information. So I'd be hard-pressed to, other than to comment that I think a lot of what I see is sample-related, but that's based on anecdotal observation and not based on clinical correlation with patient data. So I'd have to, to, to couch that in some concern for interpretation. I just don't have the clinical data to match up. Thank you. The next one is for Dr. Irwin. Does someone have experience using a dropatized PCR method with this platform? Okay. Um, no, not that I know of. Um, we, we use a very standard, just multiplexed 5 microliter PCR um, with, with this platform. We haven't done any dropatized PCR um, amplification. Okay, Dr. Irwin, this next one is for you too. What sample types can be tested with these panels? Uh, and I think, I think Dr. Sutton can also weigh in, but basically um, almost any sample type. Um, base, our amplicon sizes are 60 to 80 base pairs in, in, in length, so we do need intact DNA down at that very short fragmentation size. So this, we find that this is robust. Of course, we can use buccal cells, uh, white blood cells, buffy coats. We can use FFPE samples, fresh tissue, uh, fine needle aspirates that have been put into FFP. We also do work on circulating cell-free DNA and circulating tumor cells, and potentially it would work on, on um, cell-free DNA in urine as well. If I may yeah, comment that. on that, um, in the clinical laboratory, the only sample type we are validated for is formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissue. Any other fixative um, we don't have experience with, and uh, currently, uh, acid decalcified tissue blocks are also a cause for uh, rejection of a specimen because of the, the DNA is just too degraded to get a good sample from. Thank you. This next one is for um, both of you too. Maybe Dr. Sutton, you'll want to weigh in first. How long does it take to generate results? Well, we perform the tumor assay uh, once a week. And essentially it is in our laboratory, I know they've mentioned that you can go, you can get sample to answer in about eight hours. We have our process set up to go from extraction of the DNA through to um, PCR data acquisition to interpretation over about a two-day period. In terms of the interpretation, um, we have it set up where we do a twofold where the technologist who generates the data goes through the spectra, goes through the interpretation algorithm that's um, it's actually quite user-friendly. The, 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 the software that Agena has built into this is, is easy to learn, I, felt, I have found. But they go through it, they give me that result, and then I go through it independently and put both of those two together. So two different sets of eyes look at the same spectra and come to the same, hopefully the same interpretation as a quality check. Um, and the actual interpretations is built into our computer system. There's a lot of mutations here in this very large panel. Uh, all of that 
I wrote those interpretations myself, and they've been essentially hard-coded into our Millennium Cerner uh, LIS, such that when a colon sample, for example, with a KRAS G12C mutation is entered in, the appropriate uh, interpretation will fire for that. So that all of that work on the backside was um, work that I did for for the clinical laboratory. And Dr. Irwin, too. Well, I think Dr. Sutton has has uh, answered it quite well. You're you're working with a two-day process, including extraction. Our newest instrument does automate one of the previously manual steps, and that was the 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 DNA um, the the cleanup um, after the amplification, the spotting, and that does accelerate things um, slightly, or it reduces the the the, the hands-on um, step that is required, which often requires people to take two days um, to to and, generate those results. And we have put in the chip prep module and we have seen some economy in this as well. I don't have numbers in front of me, but I can tell you that the technologists doing this assay love the load up and walk away. And I, I believe we're, we're seeing decreased error because of the control you get through the spotting um, with the automated equipment. So. I think the chip prep module, which is our name for it, has been a, a nice addition to our lab. That's our name for it too, so we're, we're using common term, terminology. Okay, well, it looks like we have time for one more question, and this one's for both of you also. Dr. Sutton, uh, maybe you could weigh in first. Um, how many samples can you typically test in a run? Well, my run today, to give you an example, is what we call a three-chip run. And this includes a positive, a negative, and a no-template uh, mm -hmm. water control. Um, and I think we have, well, here, I've got it written in front of me, that we, ha we had about 10 colon cases, two lung cases, and one melanoma case. And it went a little bit longer because we also had some additional uh, samples. I think they were our proficiency samples that we had to add on. So that made for a three-chip run. A usual run for us is one or two chips. And we run typically five to maybe, maybe 10 or 12 cases that are clinical mutation cases for solid tumors a week. And Dr. Irwin, would you like to weigh in as well? Sure. So we, we do have um, several different formats of the instrument. Uh, the chip prep module format, which we've been talking about with that automation, is a 96 uh, format. With our HS panels, um, on a 96 well chip, that allows up to 12 samples on a single chip. So you can do, do 12 samples on a, on, on a single chip on either of, the, either of the panels. So it could be six colons and six lungs, or so on and so forth. But you can also do multiple chips, as Dr. Sutton mentioned. So you can, you can, depending on thermocycler availability, you can do up to 10 or even 20 chips um, um, on, on that instrument and, and run chips in parallel. Well, thank you. I would like to once again thank Dr. Irwin and Dr. Sutton for their presentations. Do you have any final comments? The only thing that I would add is I, I think the mass array has been a wonderful addition to the molecular pathology laboratory here. And um, I'm very happy to also mention that our grant funding just got extended. So um, I hope, more, I, I know more patients will benefit from having this technology in our area, and that's a good thing. I'd like to personally thank Dr. Sutton. Um, we've been working together for, for, for many years. Um, Agena comes up with the technology and then Dr. Sutton works with us to show how that works on clinical cases, which is an important part of our understanding and our, 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 our deployment of this technology such that it's relevant for the market. So thank you, Dr. Sutton. You're very welcome. Thank you again, and I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by Agena Bioscience via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank our sponsor, Agena Bioscience, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credit. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. 
This webcast can be viewed on demand through October 26, 2017. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay, and we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.